it's again a blessing to be able to come to you today, but uh, we're actually coming with a heavy heart because so much is happening around us, so much is going on in our world that uh, I, I just can't understand how we can be preaching the gospel. Jesus Christ came and, and died on the cross sacrificially that we might be able to operate in the kind of spirit of sacrifice and the spirit of love. And yet still, we're living in a time when with all the preaching, with all the teaching, with everybody declaring the word of God, how is it that we can have so much hatred, so much malice, so much prejudice, so much bigotry? Uh, how is it that with all of our preaching and teaching and the voices of the church are not unified in the presentation of what should be justice, what should be mercy, what should be holy and holistic and proper from a social viewpoint. It seems as if we have thrown up our hands and we've decided to allow ourselves to do just anything we want to do. So it's just a very sad time today uh, when you consider the fellows who, uh, in, in just the normal operation of life, uh, just because they're black, they are completely decimated and treated like inferior people and citizens and, and treated like animals and even worse than animals because we protect animals. Uh, so my heart is heavy today and, and, and then to add even further, we lost one of the most beautiful people you would ever meet in your life. Uh, I would like to pray for uh, Sister Beverly Tomlinson, German. Uh, I'd like to pray for her and her family and, and uh, Elder Lamar, German's family, that God would just comfort them in this time. It was not the coronas. Uh, it, that didn't take him out. He's just been sick. And, uh, and God has uh, gave him happiness, gave him happiness with one wonderful and beautiful lady uh, that he married to for just a few uh, a few years I could even say a few months really uh, but we 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 just want to pray that God will move in a very special way upon us today and 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 just bless us in every way he can because we're in a troubled time and when he said pray for our governments he meant it pray for the time in which we live the administrators our leaders on every level that we might find justice in this country and peace and serenity, tranquility, that we might live with each other in love. Heavenly Father, we come in the name of Jesus and as we approach your throne, we thank you for the privilege you have given us. And our hearts are heavy, as you know, because the Holy Spirit dwells in us and you feel what we feel right now. We pray for the German family. Yes, we ask you to comfort Beverly in such a way that your spirit will move upon her and give her peace. We thank you because she gave him in the last days of his life the happiness that he had been searching for. And we thank you for bringing them together and for the love that she exhibited towards him and the love he had for her. And we pray now for their family and for the church family, for the ministerial uh, association at the City of Refuge, that the comfort will be extended to all of us because of the brilliance and the greatness of this man. We pray now for the families surrounding the Aubreys and the family surrounding the Floyds for the circumstance and situation that we have to go through again and again and we ask you, Lord, that you might step in and touch everybody. We pray for uh, this, the whole pandemic and going to 100,000 deaths. Uh, we, we ask you to stay the hand of the death angel in this matter and give us the wisdom to operate as we should. And we ask it all in that wonderful, mighty name of Jesus. Uh, it is imperative for you now, uh, well, I'm saying imperative, but I'm just requesting that you uh, have a watch party and uh, of your own on Facebook and, and tell everybody that we're on and that uh, we have 
I believe a word from the Lord. I don't always say that because many times we uh, make a declaration that uh, is really out of our own thinking, but the Spirit of the Lord says differently. Now, I want to again reiterate to all of my pastors and all of my leaders because it seems as if we, we, we have a, a disconnect when it comes to the Bible as we understand the God of the natural, the God of the supernatural. Uh, I'm looking for my glasses. I can't find them. Uh, I've been locked up in the house. The glasses are in the house. And I don't know why I can't find something that's in a house that I live in. And I haven't taken them out. But anyway, I wear glasses. Uh, I don't expect with the technology that God has given through the consistency of his natural laws, that ophthalmology is, uh, is, is able to be performed simply because uh, the, it's out here and, and God is the one who declared this. We're listening to science and we're understanding that there are certain limitations and, and, and sometimes we get carried away with petty things as if we don't understand how essential it is for people to be alive. We, you, you, we don't minister to dead people. We minister to people who are alive. And the natural laws operate within the parameters of our relationship with God. So, yes, we want to be back together in church, but it, it won't be the same. You're going to have people sitting separately from each other and, and nobody can touch, nobody can hug. There is no uh, holy kiss. There is nothing but separation. So let's wait until things are safe enough for us to function and operate. You can't have a choir behind you. you, you, you you're separated further from the people in the pulpit than they are sitting in the pews. So my brothers, my leaders, my pastors, let's vie on the side of life, on the side of life, and let's be very careful for the members that God has put under our care and in our trust. I want to say that because we are rushing and moving to go back and uh, we can't politicize this. It has to be done in favor and for the benefit of the people of God. We have to understand again too that there's a lot of mental situations that are happening now. People are, 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 are slipping psychologically and mentally and they need care and they need care that's beyond my pay grade and my ability to handle and that's why God has put people out there who are Christian counselors. People who operate out of the biblical uh, point of view to touch people's lives and so uh, that's where we are today. Uh, we have to pray that we don't rush back in the name of God. We've done so much in the name of God at the expense of the health of the people that we serve. And so that's my word to you before we go any further. Uh, again, now we're going to talk about reopening, uh, but we're going to continue the off online virtual service until further notice. And then I'm going to prepare the city of refuge for the way that we're going back. I have it outlined, I have a committee, I'm going to have health officials, I'm going to have nurses and doctors from the city on the committee, I'm going to have people who are sensitive uh, to the people of God on that committee so that when we go, we go back properly. Uh, I'm praying for all black males, I'm praying for black males not simply because of the police and their behavior and because our justice system fails horribly when it comes to dealing with my brothers uh, in the flesh, uh, my black brothers. But I'm not only praying for black males because of police brutality and because our social environment and our justice system is laying flat on its face. Uh, I'm telling you at the end of the day that we need to take the blindfold off that lady because that lady is looking around and is extremely prejudiced because she's being motivated and moved by a dominant culture that doesn't understand that you cannot be stronger than the weakest link in your community. And uh, when I'm praying for black males, uh, as we move in and out and around, my sons, my grandsons, your sons, your grandsons, 
who are black, and I need my white evangelical brothers and my white evangelical sisters. Instead of lauding and praising the system, get back into your Bible and practice love and understand that all men are created equal by God and he loves each one of us and regardless of color and creed and that the Holy Spirit is the single greatest unifier in the world and if you have the Holy Spirit then you're a part of the body of Christ as I am and that means we love one another by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples by your love one for the other and that's why we embrace people of different races and colors and creeds because God came for God so loved the world not just a particular race he loved the world and for too long, dominant cultures have used religion and the name of Jesus to enslave and break people down and to keep them oppressed. And God is not with that. He's not for that. And I'm questioning the salvation of some people who can only speak up for certain things that suit them, but not speak up for everybody across the world. Uh, and, and I don't I shouldn't have to be uh, declaring this my white brothers in Christ who have black folks sitting in their churches all over their churches some of the churches are dominantly black predominantly black with white pastors where black people in church can't be on the board can't operate in the office can't operate visually in these churches and if, if, if God has moved us to love, then you should love and you should love us as we love you and we forgive everything and yet still we're forgiving a group of people who don't want and don't act like they are in the same Christian vein that we are in. And this is problematic. Somebody ought to speak up and declare, you're killing my members' children, the people who I want to be saved. I don't want them shot before they're saved. I don't want them killed in the street. I don't want people kneeling in their necks. I don't want people killing people who are jogging in neighborhoods. But I'm also praying for those of us who are killing each other. So it's not just white, black. It's black on black. And it's all because we're psychologically debilitated because we're made to feel like we're less than anybody else. And I'm saying to my black brothers, Anytime you kill a brother, you're committing suicide. It ain't homicide, it's suicide. And so now we've got to come to grips with a pandemic, then we gotta deal with the white police killing our boys, then we gotta deal with black on black crime, now we gotta deal with increased suicides, now we gotta deal with more family abuse inside, and we've been preaching for years and years, 2,000 years plus, since Jesus has left the earth and left us with salvation, and we're in a Christian country, Christian because it's not Hindu, because it's not Muslim, because it's not uh, 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 Buddhist, uh, Christian because it is incomparable religions different from the others. But it's not Christian because it follows the tenets and edicts and maxims of the word of God. And so we're living in a country that is pseudo-Christian, uh, having a form of godliness denying the power thereof. That's why everybody wants to rush to church so we can hide in sanctuaries without windows and we can have our little exclusive clubs and be segregated on Sunday and, and, and then come out in the world and kill one another, not have any kind of dis discipline towards each other, love towards each other. And where there is no love, there ought to be laws. And we have no love and we don't follow the laws. So yes, I'm upset today because this is a day that we should be extolling the virtues of Jesus Christ as Christians in America. White and black makes no difference. I love my white brothers. I wish they'd love us the way we love them. I wish that they would operate in justice, just justice, because that's what God's called for. He told Israel judges, don't be afraid of their faces. Do your judgment. You can't politicize judgment and justice. It's for all of us.
and go back to your own constitution and remember what it said and follow it if you will. Because when you left the feudal system, you came to America and you put together a document that would express the pain of what you came out of and at the same time express how we should live going forward. You had the document, yet still you wasted the Indians all at the same time and just completely destroyed them. And then finally you came up with all men are created equal. Now come on, you brought slaves into the world here and for 400 years you kept a group of people suppressed and depressed and oppressed. And now you have the opportunity under the banner of Jesus Christ to show love to everybody that comes and equality and justice to everybody. So open your mouth and stand up for what is right. Stand up for the God we serve, that we're all connected through the Holy Spirit. And I just believe some folk aren't connected, period. It's just coming out of their mouth. But there has to be genuine love. God didn't tell me to tolerate my white brother and my white sisters. He told me to love them. But now everybody's operating under the banner of division. And it's coming from the top all the way down. So now we're seeing in America, based on leadership, just the condition of the people that we've been dealing with every day. I, I should not be a, get in my car and have to worry about a policeman stopping me, handcuffing me, and then kneeling in my neck until I die. Where is the humanity? And people kneeling all over this brother until he is dead? I can't breathe. You, you policemen are supposed to protect and serve. They're not a military arm of a presidential situation that is divisive. And, and they're not a military arm of Nazis. Nazis killed more Americans than any other group in the whole wide world. In World War II, we were fighting Nazis. We sent folk across the water to fight Nazis. Memorial Day. We celebrated men who died fighting Nazis. And all of a sudden now, we've got a country full of neo-Nazism and a military arm called police that now is acting as if they were the extension of Nazism and racial disorder and hatred. We've got to stop it, and somebody's got to cry aloud. All right. The graduating class of 2020... Uh, I, what a change, <laughs> what a switch. Uh, Thursday the 28th at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time, we will feature the virtual graduation class of 2020. I'm going to give a little speech. I'm going to talk about commencement, new beginnings, which is indicative of the fact that you have conquered where you were until you get to the place where you can start again in a progressive situation. My granddaughter's going to Yale, and I told her, I said, when people are leaving, I asked her, was she ready to leave uh, home and to be away? And first, she went to being raised properly, so she's ready to go. And I said to her, I said, OK, understand this. It's the people who are left behind that feel the greater sense of abandonment or the greater sense of losing somebody's presence. The person who is going out into new adventures and going to new levels, that individual doesn't feel the same intensity of loss of presence as the one who is left behind because the adventure is in front of them. What am I going to become? What am I going to do is right in front of them. So the one who's leaving going into new territories, don't have the same pain. So she's going to drop a tear, I told her. And I told her, I'm not going to cry at all. I'm not crying. And, and of course, she want to know why wouldn't I cry? Because she's going to Yale and not going to jail. So I'm not crying one bit. And I'm saying to you, graduating class, understand this. You have left an arena where you had to conquer and you had to achieve, and now you're facing, because of that achievement, another challenge where you're going in to achieve. So commencement, new beginnings, starting over, 
in another realm, in another height, not going back to repeat, but using what you have gained on whatever level you are commencing from. Use that to strengthen you, to understand psychologically you are an achiever, so you're going forward. That's my speech. I'm going to give it a little bit later. Again, we created an email address for everyone who needs one-on-one -on -one prayer, salvation, receiving the Holy Ghost, and baptism. So find that on your email, prayer at cityofrefugela.org. That's prayer. On your email, you send it to us. We'll get back to you. Prayer at cityofrefugela.org. Again, our Friday night prayer, corporate prayer, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Please call 760-548-9309. I hope you're getting your watch parties together before I go into the word. In terms of giving the website, cityofrefugela.org. The app is Noel Jones Ministries. The and uh, the text to give, and, and last week I said, Corla, uh, Corla, send our money back, please. <laughs> because text to give is C-O-R-L-A to 888-364-4483. So that is C-O-R-L-A, oh, yes, it is the City of Refuge, L-A, C-O-R-L-A, and it is 888-364-4483. Our cash app is dollar sign City of Refuge LA. And of course, for those who have been mailing, 14527 San Pedro, California. Well, it's really San Pedro Street, Gardena, California, 90248. So um, I, I'm just gathering my thoughts and getting my mind together. And I want to take you with me for a little journey into Second Chronicles again, chapter 20. But right now I want to read uh, from verse chapter 20, that Second Chronicles 20, I want to read verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers unto the Lord, and that should praise the beauty of holiness, as they went out before the army and to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. And when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushment against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which was come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. And when Judah came toward the watchtower in the wilderness, they looked into the multitude and behold, there were dead bodies fallen to the earth and none escaped. And when Jehoshaphat and his people came to take away the spoil of them, they found among them in abundance both riches with the dead bodies and precious jewels, which they stripped off for themselves more than they could carry away. And they were three days in gathering the spoil. It was so much. And on the fourth day, they assembled themselves in the valley of Barakah. For there they blessed the Lord thereof. Therefore, the name of the same place was called the Valley of Berakcha unto this day. And they returned every man of Judah and Jerusalem, Jehoshaphat, in the forefront of them to go again to Jerusalem with joy. For the Lord had made them to rejoice over their enemies. And they came to Jerusalem with psalteries and harps and trumpets unto the house of the Lord. And I got, I'm glad I got through that without my glasses. Uh, <laughs> that, was, that was quite a challenge, quite, quite a work. Uh, the battle is not yours, the battle is the Lord's. Uh, I want to approach this, uh, I don't know uh, about the hermeneutics totally and completely, but I want to approach it in a manner that may be a little avant-garde for the theologian, for the one 
ones who understand how to expostulate the scripture. And I want to go back to J. Haziel because if you understand chapter 20 where Israel is facing an enormous enemy and when you're facing an enormous enemy the call to prayer and the call to assemble all of Israel is critical because you need the unity especially when you're the underdog to be able to defeat your enemy. I, I, I'm saying that because I want to get you to understand definitely and absolutely that there is no way to be the underdog. There is no way to be less than your enemy and defeat that enemy while you're divided. There's absolutely no way that you can defeat an enemy when you're divided. And this is why I go back to Jehaziel because it's Jehaziel who because of his prophetic ancestry, because of his prophetic authenticity, which is based on his ancestral resume, because if you notice in verse 14, then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. And it was he who told them, Hearken you, Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Now notice, I had a problem when I saw Jehaziel, and according to the scriptures, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mattaniah, a Levite, the son of Asaph, and I had a problem because I said, why is a chronicler giving me all of this data on Jehaziel? But I understood now that he could be trusted for his prophetic declaration because it was based on his ancestral resume. Jehoshaphat had already had problems with prophets. And we're living in a time now where we have to have the authenticity of the prophetic word, particularly if we're going to operate outside of a military operation, and that's what Jehoshaphat had to face. I need a word from the Lord that's authentic, but in order to have an authentic word, I need to check the resume of the one who's making the declaration that the battle is not mine, the battle is the Lord's, and I'm going out there with a group of minstrels and singers to face an enemy, the mere fact that the prophetic word is so absurd, I need to be able to authenticate whoever is declaring the word. I think we've come to a time now where we need to authenticate the voices that we're listening to because we are in serious trouble if we're going to get through the time in which we live, we're going to have to get through it together. And that's why in the absurdity of the declaration of leading with a group of choir members and singing a group of songs against an enemy who has all the equipment to fight in a normal military way, we need to know this is really God. I hear people talking about going back to church and they're going back to church being led by the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit has always moved us into the word of God and leads us into all truth. So wherever there is truth, that's the function of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not operate against truth and biblical truth. 
That's why you feed the Spirit of God with the Word of God and that's where your victory comes. It doesn't come from subjective theological declaration with no association to the Word of God. It's got to be connected. I don't understand preachers. What are you preaching? You don't preach simply by leading. You preach through understanding the Word of God. And that Word stands sure. And the Spirit of God is not separate from the Word of God. When he said, let there be light, light came from the Word. The Word is Spirit that moved light to come into being. So you can't separate the Word from the Spirit and operate in the spirit separate from the word, it does not work. The spirit and the word operate together to lead us into all truth. So let's not be conformist, let's be transformed into the newness of life that is operating through the power of the Holy Ghost. So prayer becomes a highlighted testimony of his fathers as it relates to God. Jehoshaphat had to go to prayer and had to bring the people of God into a place where their togetherness was operated in that sanctuary where God told them to go forward. So here is the testimony. Art thou not God in the heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathens and in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee. So now here is the declaration of Jesus to us. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You have to extol the virtues of the power of the God of the heavens who wants his rule to be exhibited on earth. But his rule can only be exhibited through the people who know his word, know his principles, and operate with the power of the Holy Ghost to unite us so that when we pray, we're not praying amiss or praying segregatedly or praying away from each other, but all of us are praying moved by the same spirit. And the spirit of God in us as individuals expresses itself by our love one towards the other. And one towards the other love unites us against common enemies. And injustice is a common enemy. Treating brothers with indignity and treating the people around you as if they're peasants, as if they're not worth anything, is a common enemy to the Christian cause and to the scriptural premise that we stand on. And we need to understand that. Thy will be done on earth. It is not God's will for policemen to be kneeling in his image, in, in people in his image and his likeness. It is not his will for man to be enslaving one another and hating each other. It is not his will for folks to use the Bible as a means of oppressing and taking other people's wealth around the world. It is not his will. And that's why I agree totally and fully with the Unification Church and with Dr. Uh, Hak Jahan Moon and her, the legacy of her husband because they understand and they have extolled the virtues of the will being done on earth. And that's why we join together with the peoples of the world in the Christian environment with Christianity leading. And Christianity leads and says that we have to come together as a group of people who are in the image of God. It doesn't matter the shape of your eyes or your nose. It doesn't matter the color of your skin. They're black Cadillacs, white Cadillacs, red Cadillacs, gray Cadillacs, but they're all Cadillacs. And they all have the look of a Cadillac. And all of us have the look of human beings. One blood under the earth. I can, be I can give a transfusion to a white person. I can give a transfusion to somebody in Asia. I can give a transfusion because the blood, one blood, one blood. And it's critical to understand this. And that's why me as a black preacher should not be hollering this. My white brothers all are hollering. My Spanish brothers all are hollering. My Asian brothers and sisters ought to be screaming, why? Because if we are those who are given the task of his will being done on earth as it is in heaven, 
then we should be all in unison declaring that anything that is not just, anything that is not true, anything that's not gentle, anything that's not patient, anything that does not have long suffering, anything that's not merciful, anything that's not temperate is not of God. Because that's what the kingdom of heaven is and that's what he wants his will to be done on earth. So the question now is, do we have the relationship with the Elohim in the text as creator, sustainer, and savior of his people? So when I look then at power, power here, uh, the Hebrew is strange and unusual. When I look at might, it's the idea of being strong, a champion warrior. A champion warrior with unusual powers. That's his prayer. Art not thou God in heaven. So the children of God have to operate in the same vein as their father. Which means then that God has given us through his word that unusual and strange kind of power. And that same God has given us a champion warrior strength. And that is, we are champions for God with unusual powers because the weapons of our warfare, oh, I wish somebody uh, was with me. The, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. So it is here where the unity becomes critical because we have to join under the power of God which flows in each one of us through the Holy Ghost, and that gives us the unity that makes us a champion warrior with unusual power. So we don't come against the powers that be with rebellion and fighting and cursing and, and going into some sort of revolution that means killing and requiting and giving back the evil that we have received. That's not what we do. What we do is we go with unusual powers that are spiritually motivated, that are moved because of our unity. The problem with us in the nominal visible church is that there is too much segregation and separation in the visible church. But the real church of God is united to the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's where the voices cry out into the world. Cry aloud and spare not. That's what the church has got to do now. Not only one group in the body, but all of us in the body need to make the same declaration for justice, for mercy, for proper behavior, for dignity and decency. Because we declare from a biblical standpoint which undergirds the Magna Carta, which undergirds the Constitution. And if we are Christian, then we ought to persuade men and women who have different attitudes in our country, in our racial confines, in our space. We need to convince them that the biblical and proper way is to treat everybody as if they were created by God. And they were, and they are, and that's how we ought to operate. The unusual powers are exhibited then in many battles which totally defy conventional warfare tactics. Gideon had the same thing. The issue of confusion and the use of division. That's what happens when you want to defeat an enemy. You use confusion and you use division. Now here's what Satan is doing to America. He is using confusion and you, you got confusion when you don't know what story to believe. You don't know what tweet to believe. You don't know what account to believe. That's confusion. Then you have division. And division is when one group speaks negatively about another group or treats another group negatively. So the group that's being treated negatively has to defend him or herself against the individuals who are treating them negatively. So now you've got oppressors and those being oppressed and you've got war between them. And that is a move of Satan. 
Because Satan understands that anything divided cannot stand. Oh, let's get into it now. God is one. God is one. And the number of unity where there is no divisive element of any kind. One. One cannot be divided. Because that's an element that stands solely upon itself. God is one. Even with the revelatory distinctions of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, he is still one. Even with those distinctions. It is the one God whose revelatory expression as Father. It's the same one God who has a revelatory expression as Son. It is the same one God who has the revelatory expression of the Holy Ghost. I'm a father. I had a father, so I'm a son. And I had a wife, so I was a husband. But I'm still one person. Yet I exhibited qualities of fatherhood. I expressed qualities of being a son. And I certainly, for 22 years, expressed the qualities of being a husband. But I'm still no joke. One. Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God is one God. Now this, of course, is a place of profound simplicity in which neither duality or duplicity can be found anywhere in God. There is no duality. There is no duplicity. There is no changing. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. Nobody can operate their lives in duplicity and duality because you don't know where you're going. You don't know what to believe. You don't know what to follow. I, listen, I, I, in, in my discussion, and I think that now that I'm locked away and I have these one-on-one -on -one discussions with people, I'm beginning to think, as I said to my family the other night, every time we get together and have a conversation, we ought to have a tape recorder going, and I'm believing that. Uh, one of the reasons why we have so much silence from the people who should be verbal is because oftentimes... People use your personal imperfections to shut your mouth from telling truth because you don't want to be investigated. All of us have secrets. I got some that I wouldn't want to publish, things that I had to struggle through and got over, mistakes that I made, but my personal mistakes, my personal imperfection does not eliminate me from being genuine. Right, should I say that again? If you're genuine, you will admit to your personal imperfections that you keep secret. Genuine is what we're looking for from the voices of the people who declare they know God, from the leaders who declare they know God. And understand the oneness of God does not give room for duality or duplicity. That does not have anything to do with your personal imperfections that you're striving every day to get over. In the middle of your imperfections, you still ought to be genuine. Sila, I got to pause. Because we're living in a time where we understand nobody's perfect. I get up sometimes and I play uh, with the members uh, of the City of Refuge and I play. And I say to them, do you believe anybody's perfect? And they holler, no. You don't think I'm perfect? And they say, no. Can I tell you my problems? No. <laughs> you see, they know you're not perfect. They don't want to know your problems. But at the end of the day, everybody who's genuine will admit to not being perfect. But I cannot use my imperfections 
as a means to shut my mouth from being genuine and truthful. Please, it is necessary for us to understand there is no duplicity and no duality. It cannot exist in God. Time has no effect on it because as an eternal being, changes and polarity are impossible with God. And we are the children of God. The difference with us and he is that we have imperfections. He is perfect. We have imperfections, but we ought to be genuine. James puts it this way, and I quote, and if I miss a word or two, I don't have any glass. Every good gift and every perfect gift comes from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow or turning. There is not even a shadow when he turns. There's no dark side at all. Why? Because there's no light brighter than him. In order to have a shadow, you got to have a light that comes against something that casts the shadow. But there is no shadow because there is no light brighter. There's no variableness because the total consistency of who he is. You and I, we rub things on our skin to make our skin uh, sort of blend in with the rest of the skin that might have been in the sun and so there are no lines. That's not God. Everything about him is light. Everything about him is perfect and genuine. And there is no room for it. Uh, the, the, uh, one writer says, and I quote, Uk evi. there is no room for it. Negatives, not only the fact, but the possibility also, unquote. He is such an intense unit that, that there is no possibility of discord. There is complete union in the revelatory expressions of, of, of God. There is still that total oneness. That's why when we come into him, he declares, there is neither Jew nor Greek. Now understand that when you look at the biblical attitude of the Jewish people, you will find that they were very segregated. They were segregated because of their total combating oppression. They have always been in a land where they had to agree with each other and hold on to each other. And the time when they had the greatest amount of oppression was during the time of judges where every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Their divisiveness in the book of Judges led them to be completely and totally oppressed by various nations in the land because they wouldn't harmonize. Now, now let, me, let, let me go deeper into it. In order to harmonize, one of the things that we have to do is we have to have a document that all of us agree on. This is what makes unity. Listen to me carefully. In America, we swear allegiance to the Constitution. Our president does, leaders of states do, people in the Supreme Court do. We do not swear allegiance to individuals because individuals vacillate. Individuals can be caught in their self-aggrandizing disposition, in their own personal attitudes, their own proclivities and tendencies that might not be uniform or beneficial to anyone but themselves. So we don't swear allegiance to people. When governments change, when different presidents come in, they swear allegiance to the Constitution. We don't swear allegiance to political parties. Because each person has their own agenda, each party has its own agenda, particularly when it comes to wielding power. And what we got a group of people who want to stay in power. So no longer do we serve the people of God, the people of the country. We serve ourselves because we want power. In order to do that, 
then we have to ignore what we swore to uphold. Because in having the document, you take away the variety of attitudes and dispositions of individuals so you're not caught with an individual who is narcissistic and then next time you're caught with somebody who is egomaniacal and then you're caught the next time with somebody who is kind and nice and then you're, you're just bouncing back and forth. If you keep allegiance to the document, this is why we don't swear allegiance to pastors. We don't fall in love and hold on to pastors as God. What we uphold is not his idiosyncratic concepts. What we uphold is his ability to stand on the word of God. The word of God then becomes what we want to hear and what keeps us all together. If all of us would understand the word of God properly and approach the word of God properly, we wouldn't have division, we would have unity. Much of the division in Christianity is the individual attitude of the person who is expostulating the word for his or her own personal agenda. That's why I keep telling you, you got to have intent. You got to find out the intent because intent determines content. And if the intent of all preachers were pure, if the intent of the English going into Africa and Europe going into Africa with the Bible, if their intent was pure, we wouldn't have a country divided with these major nations fighting each other using the, the Catholic Church going from one of the countries to the other country, whichever one suit what they wanted. And today we have got Christians who are supporting politicians outside of biblical truth. Our allegiance is not to the Republicans or the Democrats. Our allegiance is to the word of God and the word of God deals with justice. The word of God deals with love. The word of God deals with treating other people with dignity and integrity because that's what God is. He is not a God of division. Let me take it further. In him there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For all are one in Christ Jesus. The unity of God, the power of his unity is so great that when anybody comes into his presence and connects to him in fellowship and relationship, they can't help but be one. No longer is there any distinction between Jew or Greek. There is no distinction between bond or free. There is no distinction between male or female. I don't understand how we can be in church and relegate our female pastors and preachers to a second-rate seat. They're one in Christ Jesus. The woman who is preaching, the woman who is preaching is not preaching gender. There are no gifts of the spirit that are gender driven. And yet still, we make a spectacle out of declaring, well, I don't believe a woman should pastor. I don't believe a woman should, should, should be a preacher. And go to the Bible and misinterpret and misunderstand the context. Don't know anything about the historical analysis. Don't deal with anything that deals with the time in which it was written and to understand it and glean truth out of it and apply it today. A woman is not less than a man. A black person is not less than a white person. A poor person is not less than a rich person. That's what we teach, that's what we preach. And the word of God is what we stand. When I hear oracles of God opening their mouth, it should be open on the basis of scripture not on the basis of political affiliation. Never. Scripture. And scripture makes us all one. And I'm not necessarily begging for somebody white to think that I'm, you know, I'm on their level. It really doesn't matter. What matters to me is what God thinks about me in relationship to them. I don't have power over how they behave from a spiritual point of view. 
That's why we have laws to govern how they behave. But when we have government that ignore laws, then I have to go back to love. Because if you don't love me, then you ought to follow the law. So I'm saying to my Christian brothers and sisters, those of you who are struggling with loving black folk, I'm saying to you, while you struggle, follow the law and uphold the law. Well, I don't like them. I, I can't get to like them yet. Uh, I'm trying my best to get to like them. The Lord is working with me. Uh, fine. But while you're struggling, follow the law. You cannot not have love and be lawless too and then declare you are a child of God. It don't work like that. It don't work like that. You have to follow the law until you can learn to love and learn to understand because he tells us that he infects us with his unity. Difference is totally eliminated. Therefore, there can be no confusion whatsoever. In Colossians, I read, uh, chapter uh, 3, about verse 10 through 11, and I read, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him, where there is neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision or un nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bound nor free, but Christ is all and in all. This is why we are having trouble in America. Because as Amos asked the question, can two walk together except they be agreed? And what we have is a steady diet of divisiveness that is being preached from the highest offices. But what God is saying to us as the children of God, as Christians, white, black, Asian, uh, Hispanic, uh, what God is saying to us is, you need my spirit in you and your voice from the word to influence this culture. Influence the culture. Influence the entertainment. Influence the financial institutions. And then my will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I have given you a spirit of power for you all to become one so that you can have the victory. Because there is and can be no internal conflict in God. It's either you're in him or you're not. And if you're divisive, you're not in him. If you're full of confusion, you're not in him. You just have the nominal church look. But the real church is totally different because the real church are white, blacks, and everybody from Asia and all around the world. We all are connected to the Holy Spirit as one. That's the real church. And our voices are declaring this today because we are the real church. So even when you integrate soteriology, it's absorbed by the principle of total harmony anytime. Because there can be no internal conflict at any stage in God. That's why it is impossible for God to lie. And anybody who's operating genuinely in God, when they do lie, they'll confess it. And they'll say, I lied. Why? Because God's spirit spoke to my spirit and said, you lied. And my confession is acknowledging to God that I walked outside of the principle of truth. But anybody who is in God does not lie as a pastime. Every word is a lie. No, because lies bring confusion. And people don't know how to operate when they're living with a bunch of lies. Because a lie is actually nothing at all. When you lie to me, I... I You've told me nothing. I can't make any determination. I don't know how to move forward on a lie. And that's the whole process why God does not lie. 
It's impossible for him to lie because there is no duplicity or duality in him. And anybody who comes in him has to pick up that same attitude. Lying is a sure sign of internal conflict. Lying is a sign of dualism, of duplicity and confusion in the individual. Why? Because if I'm lying, I'm saying something separate from my, what I know is true. And if I'm saying something separate from my know it's true, then there's duality in me. I am confused. And I'm spreading my confusion by voicing it. And so the issue then of indecision and doubt does not sit well with God. Because now he turns around and tells us a double-minded man is unstable in all his way. Double-minded. In this context, it's not deceitful, but it's dubious and undecided because there again, it brings polarity, internal conflict and confusion. And God does not respond to confusion. That's why he says wavering. When you waver, you get nothing from the Lord. This is the psalmist. This is why when you read the psalm, he hurries to settle a question. Soul, soul, why art thou cast down? Oh, my soul, why art thou disquieted within me? When I feel that inner confusion coming that brings on depression and doubt, then here's the response. Hope thou in the Lord, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Whenever he shows up, he removes confusion and doubt. His consistence of his countenance brings me to the place where I understand that God is not the author of confusion. At the same time, it is impossible for God to lie. And yet still, when he wants to destroy an enemy, oh, I hope you see it. When he wants to destroy an enemy, he can send singers who are together praising him. And at the same time, their praise goes up to God. And God will send confusion in the camp. But let, me, let, me, let me take it further. Because I'm wondering now, where is America sitting in the sight of God? Because anytime I see division in America, I see America falling apart. Right, let, let me go further. He is not the author of confusion, but he's always confused the enemy. How do I reconcile the statement? When I look at the historical document of God's behavior when he's dealing with the enemies of his people. He knows more than anyone the cataclysm that comes from division and confusion. This is why there's none in him. So because there's none in him, he knows more than any being because he's a supreme being and the supreme being is so much one. Here's what he says to you and I. Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation and every city or house that's divided against itself shall not stand. It ain't a possibility that it might. If Satan casts out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then shall his kingdom stand? The devil ain't against himself. The devil's kingdom is solid. And in order for us to defeat the kingdom of Satan, we have to be solid. The problem with America now, why China is moving so rapidly to take over the world, and look in Ezekiel and you'll see, the king of the north, the king of the east, and you'll get a chance and, and understand this, that is in reference to where Israel is. King of the north, king of the east. Understand that. It ain't said nothing about the king of, from the west because the west is sitting over here divided against itself and every great empire destroyed itself from within every great empire came down not because of outside forces 
but because of internal conflict. That's why when the Lord wanted to stop them from building the tower, he interjected something that is not a part of himself, but he knows it defeats the enemy. Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will restrain, be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. So go to, let us go down and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Understand the judgment that confusion brings. It stops you from getting to that place that God would have you to be. Anytime you have a nation that breathes and lives on division. You have a nation that's about to crumble in every manner whatsoever. If you have a thought for the lives of the people in your nation, and if you have a thought for them above money, then you will understand that your money will only come when the people are together, when the people are healthy together, when the people can advance together. When the divide between rich and poor is broken down, so at least you have a ladder. The ladder has no rungs in it now. You can't be poor in America and become rich climbing up the ladder because the rung, the next rung is so high up, you can't reach it because the division is so great. I was in Ghana and uh, I went to see the, the ambassador because when I go to countries, I make sure that the embassy knows I'm in the country in case something goes down, they know I'm there so I can reach back to them for some protection or covering because I'm a part of that country and the embassy is really a part of America even though it sits in another country. And I was sitting there with him and he said to me, well, how are things in America? How are things in America? And I said to him, well, how are things in Ghana? He said, you know, we have rich, we have poor, and we have no middle class. I said, that's what's happening in America now. America has completely disavowed middle class. You're rich or you're extremely poor, and climbing up is extremely, if not impossible to do, unless you're gifted like a basketball player, some kind of sport or some kind of entertainment talent. And then again, your rise is not because of your association with those who are on top. It's because of your association with those who are on the bottom with you. You gave something to the masses that they enjoy and they elevated you. And then when you get up there, you should try to bring somebody else up so that we can get rid of this great divide. That divide is destroying us because certain people now are, have employed themselves to the group of people who run things, who are looking down on the group of people who we now regard as peasants because the feudal system is in place. Right now, we've got monarchy-oriented leaders who have nobles who sit in the Senate, who have nobles who sit in the Supreme Court, and look over the last 10 years and see how many times the Supreme Court has dealt out justice that's not partisan. They have voted and ruled for the big companies and big people. They want to eliminate unions for the small people because the country is divided. Everybody's not for everybody else. Everybody's for themselves and for the group that they have found themselves with. And so he uses confusion to destroy enemies. Go to, let us go down and confound their language so they may not understand one another's speech. So Babel now is mixed or mingled. It's like oil and flour they can't, and, and, and water, they can't come together. One floats on top of the other, but you can't stir them into each other. And that's why the Lord scattered or dispersed, not inadvertently like sheep that go astray. He did it because he confused their language. When we begin to interpret the Bible properly, all of us should have one language. And even in the nuances in the scriptures, uh, Paul says there are certain things avoid. 
certain things that you suggest or put in a scripture asegetically that you cannot exegete. If you put it in and I can't get it out, uh, then it's subjective to you. All of us should be able to get out what you declare it says. And when you do that, you have one language. When you don't have one language, then we're divided with all kinds of isms and schisms and we're separated. And there's one language God says all of us should have. By this shall all men know you are my disciples by your love one towards another. And so when you look at it, and I think I'll pick it up another time, God is not the author of confusion. That's why in the church he says limit speaking in tongues to three at most with one interpreter. No interpreter, no tongue speaker, except he speak quietly to God. Prophets speak two or three with one judge, revelation to anyone else. Hold your peace at first. Prophesy one by one to learn and be comforted. The spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches of the saints. So notice now that God and his people are united by his oneness. But he uses confusion to disband the enemy. I hope you get it. And I'm wondering with the confusion in America where everybody's telling me God is in the White House, the confusion in America cannot be God because he won't even have confusion in his church. But when he's getting ready to dismantle a nation, he allows confusion to reign. Ask yourself, America, is God with us with this kind of behavior that's causing division. Four leopards sounded like a multitude in the Syrians camp and the Syrians fell apart. Strong delusions are allowed by his permissive will. Satan is even permitted to blind the minds of them that don't believe. I'm telling you, you can't play with the word of God and play with the Christians and people who love God and tell me that God is in America with all this confusion there is. It seems to me like the country is self-destructing. Oh, I wish you'd understand. But let me talk to you a minute as I close, because I don't want to close on a negative note. I want to close on a positive, powerful note. And so let me close, powerfully. The Lord is laying in wait. He's setting a trap. When the group of praisers and worshipers, when those of us who look so helpless in face of all that's going on around us, God says, look, you are champion warriors with unusual powers. So here's what I'm going to do. While you praise me, while the enemy looks at you as if you have no strength at all. While the enemy is picking their teeth with the death of your boys, if you can just come together and praise me, I will send praisers out in front. And when they see the praises, they'll say, oh, they ain't ready for fighting. But our weapons are not carnal. So praise makes the child of God one with God. When I worship him and I praise him, and I worship him in spirit and in truth, I become one with the master. So it defines the roles between our God and his people. It becomes object and subject. And when the object in admiration, when the subject rather in admiration of the object begins to praise him, now I have moved into his court with the thanksgiving and the praise and I become one with him. So praise then sets the ambush on the enemy because when I'm praising God, he moves to protect because he dwells in the midst of praise and praise lulls the enemy into a false sense of an easy fight and victory against a group of misfits 
But the misfits didn't come with your weapons. The misfits didn't walk in with AK 45s or 15s and 45. But we didn't come in with bazookas and guns. We came in with praise because the God we serve can straighten and set any situation right because we are not carnal in our approach to situations that bother us so deeply because we are not carnal. We do not come with the natural when we come with the supernatural and we are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds so we can come rejoicing. So we go into battle declaring the Lord made them to rejoice over their enemies. On the way, praise the Lord, we go in to battle saying praise the Lord for his mercy endured forever. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. And I'm saying to these families, when you go into battle, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. And I tell you what's going to happen. When we come out of battle, we are going to be able to declare Another kind of praise coming out of battle. And that is, I will praise thee, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will show forth all thy marvelous works. When mine enemies are turned back, they shall fall and perish at thy presence. Give unto the Lord the glory due unto his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's why the children of God who come together in unity will declare against any enemy, the Lord is my rock and my fortress, my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation, my high tower. Praise him. In the middle of all we're going through, praise him in the middle of the pandemic. Praise him in the middle of injustice and open your mouth and declare that we're standing on biblical truth. And if we're children of God, black, white, Asian, Hispanic, it does not matter. We're joined together by the Holy Ghost and we ought to have one voice against injustice, one voice against police brutality, one voice against black on black crime, one voice against any kind of injustice, letting some people free while you got other people bound. We need to put the blindfold black on that woman we need to put the balance back because she don't have no blindfold now and nothing is in balance but I will bless the Lord at all times until he brings down the stronghold God bless you today heaven smile on you I, I hope I wasn't too angry righteous indignation father we thank you we pray now for those who are suffering in any manner. We ask you to comfort them. Move on their behalf. Move on their behalf. And I pray for this country, for leadership in all manner from state, local, state, federal. I pray, God, that somehow we see the writing on the wall that this great country is falling apart because of division. And I am not presumptuous enough to say, Lord, that it's your divine will. I know it's your permissive will. But I pray, God, that somehow you will turn us around so that we will understand that more than anything, division brings a great nation down. And I pray now for the world that your spirit will move and that this disease will be brought under control whether naturally or supernaturally because God we have come to the place where we know we must repent we must turn from our ways evil ways we must seek your face so that you'll hear and heal the land bless my brothers and sisters all over the world in Jesus name amen for those of you who want to become members of the City of Refuge, I haven't extended this to you, but pick up email.
prayer at cityofrefugela.org if you want to become members of the City of Refuge. And I'll accept your membership around the world, wherever you are. I guess Bella wants to be a member. Wherever you are, we will accept and receive your membership and we will communicate with you. We will tell you what to do. Men and brethren, what shall we do? We will tell you what to do. We're praying for you again on the screen. I'm sure they have put up all the ways that you can give and give as the Lord blesses you. Give as the Lord blesses you. I will look at our situation financially and as things recover, I may run some sort of telethon or something. I might get on online a thon or something and, uh, and see can we build up the coffers and be able to go forward. We're feeding people. I'm filling out a new form now uh, to a nonprofit group that God just blessed with bountiful amounts of goods and food. And I'm going to have that for your consumption so that in all of this, you won't be hungry. You'll be able to eat and have sustenance and immune systems that are functioning and operating in the middle of this disease. Now, as I go off the air again, I want to say to all of my fellow pastors and leaders, you are reaching the saints. You are reaching the saints. Some of our mothers don't have the kind of equipment to get this service but we have other members and they have children who will make sure upon their request that they get this kind of information. And I'll go further to say, for everyone who does not have, we can set it up in the sanctuary where you sit separately and look at it. We can do that. That's not difficult. So all I need you to do is get on either social media at cityofrefugela.org and put in your request or go to prayer at cityofrefugela.org and say that is what you need. I promise you we'll come and see about you. I have at least three people who are calling 20 people a day. I gave him 100,000 names to call 20 people a day and fill out a form after you've talked to them so that I can see what people are needing while we're away. I'm saying to my fellow pastors, don't rush in because of income, because of influence or identity. God has given you people to shepherdize, to watch over, Watch over them. Watch over them. It doesn't matter what the president says or the governor says. The people who my governor and my president should be listening to are the people who operate in science, operate in that natural field that God has given. And God has made government his power. His power. So listening to them is not disobeying God. Get it straight. The lives of our people. One of my great brothers uh, died in New York, Brother Clomax, John Clomax. One of my brothers in business, uh, and he was a trader on the stock market. He died. Gone. PG, gone. Let them not die in vain. They died probably not having the knowledge we had. If, if I know Dr. PG, if he had had the knowledge we have now, he would have protected himself. He was such a giving human being. And I know you want to be back with the people, but only if it's safe. I love them too much to lose them. I'd rather be away from them for a little season than to be away from them for the rest of my life. So please, let's honor the love we have for people and follow the rules. 
God bless you. Heaven smile on you.